Welcome to Hot Chips 24. Session 8, Data Center Chips. Uh, so Pat's uh, keynote was a great introduction for this data center session. Uh, we have representatives from uh, IBM who once owned the data center and uh, still have an important place there, an x86, and uh, also an ARM presentation. Uh, so we'll see what we think of Pat's prediction about ARM after we see that. Um, first presenter is going to be from IBM, Scott Taylor. Uh, Scott joined IBM in the mid-90s at Somerset as an SRAM circuit designer. He later moved uh, to the server group and uh, was involved in a number of the P-series processors. He's currently the circuit lead on two new series uh, uh, processors at IBM working on low-power circuit solutions. Uh, so please welcome Scott. Thanks. Good afternoon. Today I'd like to talk to you about the latest microprocessor, uh, the Power Line, the Power 7 Plus. The agenda I plan on covering today, I guess it would help. The agenda I plan on covering today during today's presentation is the following. The recent history of the Power Series, an overview of the design point, performance against various workloads, a review of our key feature enablements including scale up and scale out capabilities, our new accelerator unit, and enhanced energy management schemes, and then a wrap-up summary. Before discussing Power 7 Plus, let's first review this timeline, which shows a partial history of processors developed by IBM over the last couple of decades. Looking back early in the timeline, you can see there's really three families of microprocessors. The RS64 and Star Series, uh, developed out of Rochester, Minnesota. The PowerPC line, which was started at the Somerset Design Center, and the, the beginning of the power series that started with the America architecture. Over time, these lines converged into a unified power series, which continued to innovate with industry-changing features such as the first dual-core processor and SMT. Looking at the very recent past, the previous power processor, the Power 7, featured both a multi-core implementation as well as embedded DRAM, which brings a, a new level of throughput that was leveraged by our system group for industry-leading performance for our customers. As demonstrated by this roadmap, the Power Series has and will continue to evolve, and IBM remains strongly committed to the Power architecture. So with that thought in mind, let's discuss Power 7 Plus, the next step in this long line of leading edge processors. With Power 7 Plus, we were able to build upon Power 7 Base by adding several significant enhancements while maintaining similar die size and socket compatibility. Like Power 7, Power 7 Plus has eight cores, two memory controllers, which support up to eight buffer connections with greater than 100 gigabytes per second sustained memory bandwidth, and our SMP interconnect, which, support, which scales up to 32 sockets with greater than 360 gigabytes SMP bandwidth. So those are where Power 7 and Power 7 Plus are similar. Now let's talk about the features that differentiate the two. Since this processor is fabricated in a 32 nanometer technology, this allowed us to make the components significantly smaller, which led us to do some exciting things for both in chip and package. First, Power 7 Plus has overall reduced power envelope when compared to its predecessor, which enabled a dual chip module or DCM capability to provide more cores for scale out computing. Second, we implemented a significantly larger L3 cache whose capacity increased from 32 megabytes on the previous processor to industry-leading 80 megabytes. This memory increase will lead to a major performance growth path for scale-up enterprise workloads. Third, we included an onboard accelerator unit for cryptography and memory expansion purposes. And fourth, 
an improved idle power scheme, and enhanced active guard band management. Before we move on to the next slide, I'd like to pay attention to the transistor count, which is a little bit over 2.1, a little over 2 billion transistors. If the EDRAM cache was converted to the same size SRAM cache, the overall transistor count would be in the neighborhood of 5.4 billion. This leads us to believe that having a technology that's capable of both SRAM and EDRAM gives IBM a competitive advantage somewhere between a half and a full technology node. The picture on the right-hand side is a close-up of one of the eight cores seen on the previous slide. And I'd like to take time now to look at the enhancements that went into that core. The first enhancement, being fabricated in 32 nanometer technology, enabled approximately a 25% frequency increase based on transistor performance and enhanced power management schemes. The second enhancement, the larger L3 cache per core, enhanced the benefit of several core features such as four-way SMT. As can be seen in the picture, the L3 unit and its cadre of EDRAM macros now surround the rest of the core units. The upfront design intention was to keep the overall area roughly the same going from Power 7 to Power 7 Plus for all the core execution units and its attached caches. As units shrank due to technology scaling, more area became available for the L3 cache and was filled in by EDRAM macros. With this approach, the design team was able to increase the capacity of the cache by 2.5x. The third enhancement was a 2x increase in single precision floating point operation, which would enable a DCM socket to have greater than 750 gigaflops performance. The fourth enhancement was the addition of columns that contained power header devices. The headers will lead us to independently power the core execution units in the attached private L2 in one region, and then the L3 cache and the interface of the SMP interconnect in another one. The benefits of these headers, which enable power gating, will be discussed more during the energy management section of the presentation. These various enhancements take the tremendous performance of Power 7 Plus and enable it to be expanded in two different directions using different sockets. Using Power 7 as a base, Power 7 Plus can scale up. A single chip module, otherwise known as SCM, will allow a direct socket upgrade from Power 7. The increased frequency will boost thread strength and the larger L3 cache will improve both thread strength and SMP scalability. Or Power 7 Plus can scale out. The power reduction of the 32 nanometer enablement combined with the DCM packaging enables twice the number of cores at a, at a similar frequency to Power 7. This will give tremendous lift on the throughput for systems and the increase, increased size of the L3 cache will lower the miss rates allowing the memory bandwidth to be serving greater amounts of computational work instead of traffic due to capacity misses. Let's take a couple of minutes to quantify how these various enhancements improve performance when we compare our Power 7 8-core SCM-based system versus a Power 7 Plus 8-core SCM and DCM-based systems. Both the SCM and DCM sockets offer significant performance gains over a rich set of workloads such as Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP, OLTP, General Integer, and Java. Before we do any comparisons on the bars, let's cover the assumptions that went into the chart. On the legend, you'll see three bars, one for Power 7 SCM, one for a Power 7 Plus SCM, and one for a Power 7 Plus DCM. The systems used for a given socket is the same one used across all workloads, the Power 7 Plus bars have been normalized to the performance of the Power 7 system for that given workload. First, the performance of the Power 7 Plus SCM system. Some observations. The core count and frequency increase help scale out integer and ERP workloads. The larger cache and frequency increases are particularly beneficial to Java and to critical enterprise scale-up workloads such as OLTP. The DCM will help the large majority of workloads. In some cases, the boost will be upwards of 2x of the performance of what a Power, SCM, Power 7 SCM could attain. The larger L3 cache will help here by also reducing the traffic due to misses. In addition to performance gains on traditional workloads, Power 7 Plus provides dedicated hardware accelerators 
that will provide CPU offload and significant speed up for SSL, encrypted file systems, and active memory expansion. As can be seen on the chart, Power 7 Plus accelerators will include support for three cryptography aspects. Asymmetric math functions, which will support RSA cryptography and elliptic curve cryptography, advanced encryption standard, and secure hash algorithms, which will provide encryption and verification respectively. And finally, a true hardware random number generator to provide enhanced security. There's also support for active memory expansion, which was first introduced on Power 7. The enhanced scheme on this process will leverage the proprietary 842 compression algorithm, which is, has a highly efficient hardware implementation. The accelerator unit will support synchronous or asynchronous completion. Polling will be used for the shorter running operations such as symmetrical cryptography or memory expansion. Or asynchronous interrupt for longer running operations like the asymmetric math functions. The final item on this slide would just be pointing out that the, the sellers are evoked by a PowerPC instruction, which will work in conjunction with the hypervisor and OS. For those who are interested in seeing if the accelerators support a given function or mode, Power 7 Plus supports a rich set of algorithms and functions, and they all can be seen on the left-hand side. But the focus on this slide will be talking through the data flow on the accelerator unit. Let's take the scenario when a core, which is not pictured, needs to request the usage of one of the accelerators. The request would be initiated through a PowerPC instruction. When the instruction is executed, the LT will send a request onto the SMP interconnect to the accelerator unit. If the select criteria is met and there's room in the common queues, the request will be accepted and stored into the appropriate internal input queue. When the appropriate accelerator engine is available, the request will be sent to the DMA engine and the request will be in the, in assigned to the, when the appropriate accelerator engine is available, the request will be sent to the DMA engine and assigned to the appropriate algorithm engine. At that point, the DMA engine will start to re retrieve the input data through a series of DMA reads. Since the responding cache lines can come back in any order, the DMA engine will handle any necessary reordering. The input data will be forwarded through the appropriate channel and any necessary alignment will be done beforehand the algorithm engine will execute the request accelerator function using the local I.O. buffers to store any temporary results. When the request is finished, the resulting data will be sent back to the DMA engine to write back over the SMP interconnect to the appropriate location or locations. In some cases, when there's a combination operation, such as encrypt, then authenticate, or authenticate, then encrypt, the appropriate cipher or hash engine will leave their data in the local buffer for the other engine's usage, instead of sending the results back to the DMA engine. This will, of course, result in an increased throughput for these operations. In addition to the accelerators, one of the other key features for Power 7 Plus was adding power gating to the power family for the first time to improve idle power via the architected instructions of NAP, Sleep, and Winkle. Let's discuss these three major energy saving modes. NAP mode continues unaltered in its definition from Power 7. It had fast power savings by disabling clocks to the core. NAP will be best used when a core is underutilized and it's not clear when it would be needed to take on the next workload. The introduction of two power gating regions that can be independently controlled are key for sleep mode and what we call Winkle mode, which can be considered a more extreme sleep mode. And for those who are not familiar with the name of Winkle, it is short for Rip Van Winkle, who in a story slept for 20 years. The definition of sleep mode has changed going from Power 7 to Power 7 Plus. Previously, this mode was defined when all the clocks in the entire core were stopped, including the ones attached to the caches. While this did help save power versus nap mode, it did mean losing performance in the shared cache. Now on Power 7 Plus, sleep turns off power to the core region while allowing the fast local region, the shared L3, to continue to run and support the other active cores. Sleep mode will be best used when the core is underutilized and the wait period is known to be long, for example, when we have to fetch data from I.O. The, wink mo the Winkle mode will turn off both the core and fast cache regions to save maximum power. Based off feedback, this feature is best used for workloads under cloud computing. A better way to show the relationship between these energy saving modes and what value and trade-offs they have can be seen on this graph, mapping the amount of power saved and the response time. 
NAP will have about 10% power savings against five microseconds of wake-up latency. Power 7 Sleep, which is shown purely as a reference point, had roughly a 35% power savings against about one milliseconds in latency. The new and improved Power 7 Plus Sleep increased the power savings from, to about 85% over idle power versus three milliseconds of latency. And final, finally, Winkle Mode saves over 95% over idle power with, against a little over five milliseconds of latency, which is much shorter than the 20 years that it took Rip Van Winkle to take to wake up. One of the other capabilities on Power 7 Plus is to help, to help, increase, to help increase energy efficiency is the usage of what we call real-time guard banding. Typically, systems have to hold back as what's the maximum frequency a processor can run to to cover worst case margins or conditions. These margins are held constant over the lifetime of the system and would be considered static guard banding. Some cases where margins are needed would be due to test inaccuracies, reliability wear out, thermal or voltage variations, all which can be seen in the bar graph. On Power 7 Plus, as well as Power 7, there are circuits called critical path monitors, otherwise known as CPMs. They are highly trackable against voltage droops and temperature changes, both of which will influence the maximum frequency the processor can run at. If a CPM is located within the local vicinity of a frequency critical path, environment, environmental changes that impact the critical path will also impact the nearby CPM. If the CPM can let the clock source know about the local condition and regulate the clock source, you can start to have guard banding in real time. This can, be next, this can be best shown on the next slide where there's a simple block diagram where the CPM, the feedback to the core clock source. The DPL will provide the global clock source and it will be buffered and distributed throughout the core to all macros, including the CPMs. As voltage and temperature changes occur, the CPM will, will signal how much margin is in its local environment. Feedback from all the CPMs on our core will be fed into a sensor aggregator and that information is then fed to the DPLL. The information past the DPLL is pretty simple and pretty straightforward and can be broken into five functional states that can be seen here. The DPLL strives to keep its operating condition in the ideal margin state. So if it's notified there's not enough margin from one of the CPMs, it will slowly reduce the frequency of the clock, of the global clock. Once the slower clock reaches all the macros, the CPM will start to register a better margin and once all the CPMs agree, the DPLL will be notified that it's back in its ideal margin and no further corrections will be necessary. This next slide is meant to show the, uh, put a little bit more pictorial behind the feedback loop. As you can see, we have CPMs strategically placed around the, the core. Uh, they're placed near microarchitectural critical paths. Based off the, Hardware measurements, we believe real-time feedback from CPM can reduce how much margin is needed. The bar graph on the bottom here shows the, the, shows the components of guard band from both a non, no CPM usage versus CPM. In some cases, we believe when we use a CPM, we can reduce how much margin is needed, in some cases, even remove it. Overall, we believe we can reclaim margin with this sort of approach, which will lead to a greater efficient, energy efficient design. While well, most of our key features have been architecturally oriented, I do want to touch on one more, which falls outside the realm, the 32 nanometer technology node used for fabrication. Power 7 Plus was implemented using IBM's 32, high K, 32 nanometer high K metal gate SOI technology. This technology contains three logic devices with differing drive currents and leakage characteristics, allowing each logic path and design to be tuned for the proper balance of power and performance. We had a 13-layer back-end stack with several thick metal layers, which enabled low latency transport across the chip, maintaining critical cache and memory access latencies in spite of content growth. One other key aspect of the node is the embedded DRAM provides a three to four X density advantage for cache implementation over a traditional SRAM approach. The, des the density advantage made the massive L3 cache possible, reducing the die size by almost 40% over an SRAM implementation. The combination of these features enables this 32 nanometer technology to have the performance and density characterization of a sub 32 nanometer technology node. And as previously mentioned, this advantage is believed to be along the lines of one half to one full technology node. With that last key feature discussed, that brings me to the end of my presentation. 
So before I conclude this talk, let's review the key features to understand why Power 7 Plus is the next major step in IBM's Power Series roadmap. Power 7 Plus brings out significant improvement by scale-up and scale-out systems through our SEM and DCM sockets, respectively. The new integrated engines that are found in the accelerators optimize specific functions which will offload the CPU, and the advanced energy management functions will, will, will provide greater efficiency to data centers. I'd like to acknowledge the men and women of the Power 7 Plus design and manufacturing team. It's been a long road, but it was well worth it. Um, if there's any other questions after the conference, feel free to email me. I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Let's take a few questions. Uh, how about over on this side first? Ken Wagner from PMC. Uh, I'm intrigued by your CPMs, which were also on the Power 7. Can you say a little bit more about how you uh, uh, select the critical paths, how you d deal with OCV and other non-systematic defects in actually getting an o a CPM to work properly? So there's a couple different aspects. Um, the CPM in general is made up of, I'll say, four to five different what we can consider critical, critical paths. Some of them will be gate dominated, some of them will be metal dominated, and there will be a combination of the two. Um, we do calibration during, uh, at man after manufacturing to kind of make sure we understand what we consider a critical path. And for each of the five CPMs, we weight them depending on where they are in the core, um, which will lead us to believe where we believe the hot spots are. We can change that on the fly if we have to. Um, as for OCL OCLV, et cetera, um, we do design our circuits to take that into account. Um, fluctuations from VT, et cetera, we try to, you know, once again, that's all part of the circuits. We've, you know, we've spent a lot of time making them highly trackable. Um, so everything you probably can throw at us, we believe we can track. Do you do the tuning on a per part basis? We do it on a per part basis, correct. Thank you. Okay, how about this side? Yes, Suresh Dharaswamy from Intel. Um, I have a question on the Winkle mode. You said the exit times were like five milliseconds, is that what you said? Correct. Uh, could you tell why it takes that long? Uh, um, just, just the, sure, so basically we're, we're saving the state and we're also emptying the caches as well. So that's what takes so long. Um, so that's, yeah. you know, for nap mode, we're just doing, you're turning off the clocks, so it's real short compared to what sleep and Winkle are. Yeah, the reason we ask is because we do the same thing in Intel and, and our exit times are order of maybe 100, 150 microseconds. I was just trying to understand milliseconds it looks a little long time. We do stay, save state and restore too and we we're just trying to understand why does it take such long. I don't have it's a good here. answer for that. I mean, I, we can discuss more. I apologize. I'll, okay. I'll say this was our first attempt. We know we can do better. Okay, um, so I'll ask you more questions later. <laughs> A refreshingly honest answer. <laughs> All right, back on this side. Shubhu Mukherjee, Kavyam. I had a question on your guard banding. Um, typically, these CPMs, I'm assuming it's some form of ring oscillators that are monitoring the frequency, right? Um, they're not. Okay, so you have some, some magic circuit over there. Yes, we have some magic circuit, that's um, correct. Typically, what I've seen in the past, and unless technology has changed in the last six months, that these are statistical in nature in which that you cannot do a one-to-one -one correlation between you know, any kind of environment. Or typically, the statistical model, like if you go to Black's Law, all that stuff, electromagnation even, these are all statistical. So I understand you're doing the tuning, but the other question is in terms of statistical, how many CPMs do you have per measurement to get that you know, four-bit output you're getting? Because if it's one, uh, the question that comes in, can you obviously trust it to have a correlation? with uh, the environment condition changes. So do you only use one or do you use many? And if you do ma only use one, how can you trust it that it's giving you the right answer? So I guess we'll say there's five across the core, but you're saying for a given instance of the five, are there multiple ones there? Uh, if it's statistical, you know, one is not a very statistical number. So the question is, do you believe it's statistical or do you believe it's not statistical? I guess I'll say a little bit of both. I'll, I'll try to hedge my answer there. <laughs> um, so I think in the sense that we do have calibration up front, but we also know there's some error based off on just using the CPM. So we don't believe it's 
straight dead on. We do, we, we do believe we add a little bit of garbage handling just for using a CPM because of what you're saying. Okay, thank you. All right, back to this side. Uh, Jerry Huck from Hewlett Packard. On your performance slide, uh, are those all the same binaries that are being run? And I noticed that on the last column, your Java, uh, I thought you said it was an eight, eight core to eight core compare. So Correct. it's all normalized to the equivalent number of cores. But when you had the DCM, you, you really accelerated the Java over even the, uh, the SCM module. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, you know, tons more co uh, cache shouldn't, shouldn't acknowledge, uh, do that. Did I understand the, yeah, the yeah, configuration? Yeah, you, you saw that correctly. Um, I'm going to play the circuit card here. I'm a circuit person. Um, I do have my chief engineer here. I think if you want to meet me after the session here on the, over here, we can talk about that. I don't have a better answer. Sorry. Okay. And last question over here. Thank you. Chong Ho Broadcom. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate on the guard band parameters that you actually tune based on your uh, process monitor? No, those are proprietary. All right. Another You're not <laughs> just answer. tuning the power supply or clock frequency? Everything do, with our, regards to our system is proprietary. Okay, thanks. All right, let's thank Scott one more time. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. All right, next we're going to hear about the uh, Intel Xeon uh, E5 family. Uh, Jeff Gilbert's going to be uh, starting us off here. Jeff's a senior principal engineer at Intel, but prefers to be thought of as just a Xeon architect. Uh, he's been in Intel about 15 years. Uh, worked, previously worked as a hardware software design contractor at a number of companies and has a master's in EE from Stanford. He, uh, he, told us he, he told me he leads a boring life, but he is also one of the few people who told us anything about his life, so I guess he's doing better than most of you. <laughs> and he describes one of his hobbies as plumbing, which I think is a good hobby for a computer architect and one that I share with him. So let's see what Gilbert has. Jeff Gilbert has said. Well, good afternoon. There are also those who think plumbing, or at least the second half of plumbing, is useful in the modern corporate environment. Um, also, uh, I did one of these presentations here about six years ago, and I apparently the people who cover this for the trade press don't have a sense of humor. So if you're here from the press, I think there's a happy hour somewhere away from here. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see, a uh, legal disclaimer. It turns out lithography has more uses than you suspect for the smaller geometries. It, <laughs> the translation of this is, if you believe anything I say, it is your fault. Uh, performance, we, 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 we try to make, we try to make uh, uh, reproducible results, but we don't always get there. Uh, this is a presentation. Actually, we do get there. These are reproducible, but you guys can connect the dots. We optimize the bejesus out of everything before we tell you about it. Oh, how'd that get in there? Uh, whoops. Um, and uh, it turns out that I started work briefly at, uh, at, at Intel in 386 era, and I met Pat Gelsinger. He was, I think at the time of memory serves, a Unix administrator. But since then, lithography is, has improved a little bit, and, and Intel has done a series of these things. We're, we are now, I, I don't think I actually mentioned it anywhere in the presentation, but we're at 32 nanometers like everybody else for the, the E5 uh, part we're talking about today. But the, uh, the problem is that, that at the rate we're going, it looks like we do have a fundamental limit. You get in trouble with Intel if you talk about the ends of Moore's Law, but I'm going to say that here anyway. I think I can see the end. And so my advice to you is in about the next 24 years, make sure your 401k is paid up because we may be out of a job. So uh, the actual purpose of this talk is to, is to go through the, the discussion of what we call the, uh, the E5 the series, of the, the, the current Xeon part. It's based on the Sandy Bridge core. And if you uh, were at IDF two years ago, you know most of what I'm going to say here. There are, this is like the 17th or 19th generation that trace, can trace back to what's called the P6, but still amazing improvements are being made throughout the core itself. Uh, the, uh, this part now has a, a, a micro-op uh, cache. It's, it's, the branch prediction has been doubled in size. 
there are lots of execution units that run better. We now have AVX, the floating point section of this, now supports uh, two AV, so-called AVX operations, which are 32 byte wide each. Floating, uh, that's eight double, uh, eight double precision floating point results per clock, per core. You can run those numbers, 64 double precision floating points uh, results per clock, or I guess 128 if you're in the single precision world. So there's a lot going on in this core that has improved the performance of just the raw, uh, the raw processing power throughout this. But what we do on this part is we take these guys and, and we, take one, we, we take the cores and put it on a ring. We had eight, eight cores throughout what we call a ring. It's circular here, but like a lot of what we do in this business, it actually isn't circular in real life, but we still call it a ring. And that ring actually has high bandwidth. And you'll see in your, in your copy of this, since I wanted to make you pay attention, I didn't put all the numbers in, so you actually have to pay the attention if you want to see the numbers. Uh, so here's the math. We have a 32 byte wide data bus in this ring. It runs bi-directional. Every core constitutes an active stop. It's pipeline, so we can get on and off uh, at each stop. 3.3 uh, gigahertz is about the top running rate that we'll get in, in uh, the mode, and so we have about uh, 1.7 uh, terabytes a second of bandwidth around that ring. That's a lot of bandwidth. Um, but we take, that, we take that ring with those cores uh, on this part and add, of course, the last level cache, about, about two and a half uh, megabytes per uh, per core. There is an interconnect between the, between the sockets, QPI, which is uh, uh, actually, this is the same uh, QPI 1.1, we call it, uh, same, uh, same interconnect that we had, or actually an evolved interconnect from the prior generation. Uh, in this generation, though, we integrate the I.O., and we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a few seconds. Uh, and there's a home agent memory controller, which is part of the QPI protocol to provide coherent access to the four channels of memory. So keeping in mind that we had the, uh, the uh, 1.7 terabytes around the ring, oh, a, a power control unit. By the way, the second half of this uh, talk, Mark, Mark will talk about the power control unit and its importance in, the, in getting performance out of this part. So the LLC itself, the last level cache, can support about 32 bytes uh, every single clock. Eight units of it provides up to about uh, the better part of eight and a half, 100 gigabytes per second out of the LLC is potential, uh, potential bandwidth there. Uh, the integrated memory controller, four channels, you can see we support uh, the next step up in uh, DDR3 frequency, uh, produces about 51 gigabytes a second of, of available memory bandwidth. QPI applying its, its uh, accelerated frequency uh, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, two-channel nature of this that are implemented, it, it runs about 51 gigabytes as well. Uh, PCIe, we have uh, 40 lines that are bi-directional. The, of the, all the numbers on there, this one is actually the one that's most, most uh, unlikely to be sustainable, and you'll see the, the real numbers. The other ones are actually close to sustainable under, under very special circumstances. But the point is that there is a lot of bandwidth throughout this chip that, that, that allows these cores to run at very fast rates. Uh, I want to look at the platform for a moment that we sit on. The, the earlier platform, the so-called Thurley platform, allowed one and two IOHs, as we call it, and you'll notice that the, uh, IO, uh, the IO hub there sits across a QPI link, uh, three, uh, three memory channels, and, uh, and a, a dual, uh, dual versions available of that. Now, you, can, you contrast that platform with a, a two-processor version of, of the E5, the so-called Sandy Bridge EP, and we start off with, with having 40 lanes per socket and, and, uh, uh, and available, and so with a two socket, uh, two processor platform here, two sockets, we have up to 80 lanes of, uh, of bandwidth uh, PCIe available. Uh, with their high, high speed interconnect between them, double high speed interconnect running both faster and wider and four channels of memory. So in terms of, of the pine, uh, providing the higher found, uh, foundation for higher performance, uh, you can see that we've, we've supplemented essentially every major part of the platform through here. The core is faster, the cache is faster, the mem more memory channels, and so forth. So, mm, that's a little bit better. Uh, then to quickly run, run, run through those again, we're running uh, at uh, higher, uh, higher bandwidth and, and uh, uh, greater number of, uh, greater number of uh, pins. Uh, we have, uh, uh, and the other part I want to mention here that's also important is that the I.O., unit is now uh, integrated into the core, and as a result, it's a part of a unified caching agent. By doing that, we'd make better use of the, 
the, the cache in the core, we, we don't have to run through uh, the, the QPI uh, link to get to I.O., so we have a much, uh, much faster, much lower latency connection between core access of I.O. Uh, on, on, this, on this generation, on this platform, than the prior platform. The other part about it is, is that, uh, uh, well, you can, you can see the, the, the points there that are, are pretty clear from that. The other issue about, about I.O.-related optimizations is that we, we try and balance the use of the core, uh, pardon me, of the cache with I.O., and we've, we've tried to improve the use of the cache with it. The read current semantics available in QPI are now used, which should lower a little bit of the write memory uh, traffic for, for normal I.O. operations. And it is possible, uh, we, we, we try to limit the, uh, the, the I.O. will use various weights in the cache, but if a CPU touches them, it becomes owned by the CPU. So if you can imagine a large circular buffer that starts out with the I.O. writing, I.O. allocation into the cache, the CPU uses it, suddenly it starts, it, it, the, uh, the uh, limits that we put on the number of ways we'll allocate are kind of suspended, and so we end up having to, having to allow up to tens of megabytes of that, of the, uh, of the cache available for I.O. transfer, and it's easily possible that you can imagine uh, a high bandwidth I.O. application actually never even having to write to memory because uh, the buffer space could be fully allocated out of the cache and, and run forward through there. So there are uh, uh, a lot of optimizations that are done to get much higher bandwidth I.O. in this generation. And that is exactly part of the comment that I, I ran ahead myself on the, on the, on the slide, the, the description of the so-called uh, what we call the data direct I.O. technology is exactly, uh, is exactly that point here. And, the, and the, other, uh, the other side effect of this, besides supporting higher bandwidth, is if you are lowering your memory write traffic, uh, the system power is reduced as well. So there are advantages all around to integrating I.O. and having a tightly coupled uh, I.O. integration in the, uh, in, inside the core itself. Uh, so, very quickly here, uh, the, uh, the, we, we are improving performance by improving all the parts. It's the architect's victory to uh, get a large number of small improvements and maybe a couple big improvements. That's how you, how you uh, improve platform performance generation to generation. So we've done that on this part with a, a, a higher speed core, uh, improving our, our uh, on-die interconnect, improving our off-die interconnect, the, the QPI, integrating I.O. And, uh, and improving uh, memory. Uh, next, um, Mark Rowland, uh, who's been at Intel about 19 years, uh, the power, uh, power performance architect for this part, will go into some of the performance numbers and some of the power management. So, Mark. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Six years ago, when we started looking at this part, we wanted to excel in three areas. First area is we wanted our platform to be efficient, and we wanted the customer to be able to see that when they measured it at the wall. Our second area was for data centers. And we wanted it such that when you add up all the platforms, you got something better than just the sum of the platforms. You got higher efficiency inside the data center. And then the third area was we want to maximize performance. Okay. So today I'll highlight uh, some of the key areas of those. So first of all, I want to show you the graph. Uh, in the graph is a power performance load line. This is very important for data centers, allows them to estimate their energy costs. Uh, in the graph, I actually have our previous parts, and the one we listed in 2010 is our Westmere part. So that was the part that went out before us. And what we want to do is we wanted to architect our performance load line so that it was an ideal, very proportional, nice linear uh, load line. So the first thing we did is we wanted to pull down the idle power. So on the idle power, uh, we improved our package C6 uh, idle power. Also, we extended our uh, power control unit uh, infrastructure. Uh, this included going out to the various VRs uh, so we can control their operation and also get feedback from them, as well as a vast infrastructure inside the die so that we can understand exactly what's going on and be able to distribute power efficiently. So on our idle power, we control um, the phase shedding, which allows us to save power at low idle points. Then, to smooth out that load line in the middle, uh, there's two key things that we did. One is we made the Uncore scalable. So let me describe that. In previous parts, uh, the Uncore, which would be the cache, the ring, and the various uh, other parts that are non-core for us, um, were fixed latencies and fixed frequencies. On this part, and this turned out to be one of the most challenging portions for the design team, uh, we actually voltage and frequency scale it. 
So at low utilizations, uh, you can find the ring at about 1.2 gigahertz, the bandwidth of the distributed cache at about 200 gigabytes per second, and the memory latency of about 115 nanoseconds for our DIMMs, uh, and that's a load to use latency. As we proceed up the load line, we go into higher performance for a 130-watt uh, TDP part. The ring would go up for all eight cores, 2.7 gigahertz. The cache bandwidth would grow to about 600 gigabytes per second to feed those cores so that they are not stalling. And the memory latency actually reduces, uh, going to about 65 nanoseconds. All of this allows us to have efficient performance. In fact, this part is the first part in which you can turn on turbo and we get a better performance per watt in our performance per watt benchmarks. Okay? The other area is what's on there is multi-rank slow CK. This is for DRAM. DRAM is your second most highest power consumption uh, in the platform. And what this does is it goes and basically does clock gating on the DRAMs. So when the memory controller is not talking to a particular DRAM, it'll go and actually disable its clock. Uh, that can save up to 18 watts in our record platform. And when I say record, it's our reference model. Okay? Um, the other area, an energy perf bias, I'll describe uh, in the next full and actually give you some examples. And the other area is I.O. power management. Uh, on this part, it has significant I.O. It has 40 PCI lanes. All that I.O. can add up to about 18 watts of just I.O. power. Uh, so we added, um, for our QPI coherent links, uh, dynamic width reduction. And for PCIe, we support this automatic um, autonomous sleep mode. And that's PCIe ASPM L1. Okay. okay. Now let me describe um, energy perf bias. Today when your OS uh, talks to the part, it describes everything in performance and frequencies. And it goes up to the TDP guaranteed frequency, but then above, it just asks for turbo, and it, that's about the extent of the interface, okay? In this part, there's anywhere from 500 to 600 megahertz of turbo. And so what we did is we extended the interface uh, to allow the operating system to actually describe to us kind of an ideal performance per watt that it would like, okay? And what that does is our power control unit receives that, and it's controlling about 23 different functions on the die distributing power, controlling I.O., how aggressive we're going into various um, I.O. saving power, our clock gating on our memory, uh, how aggressive we're at turbo, our core C states, um, all of these functions, and they get controlled by this. Now, what this means to you is if you have a Windows 7 uh, operating system and you were to have a Sandy Bridge EB2500 uh, in your uh, system, when you adjust the control panel and you go from balanced to performance mode, you will not only see the operating system change, but you'll actually see the processor's power and performance per watt change. And you can actually see that on the graph up above. So the, the balanced mode is this uh, yellow line. And when you switch to performance, you get this other line. Okay? Now, this also works for Linux and all the other operating systems. Um, what I want to describe here is if you're a data center, what you really care about is your average power. And you're going to set your data center such that you're about 20% utilized. And that's going to determine your average power bill. However, under your high load usages, what you're going to start worrying about is when do you have to start moving your jobs to another data center? So in that case, you really want maximum performance. This is where uh, dynamic switching comes in. Dynamic switching. Uh, allows us to ride the lower power performance load line all the way up, get all the great power savings, and then be able to switch over at the top. Okay? So if you, um, this allows you to get the best performance and the lowest power. And remember down here, the ring is going at a lower frequency, we're getting power savings, and then when we go up to the top, we get it, kick into that higher uh, ring frequency and performance. Okay, so now let's touch on the data center. Okay. Uh, Sandy Bridge line is the first line in which uh, the processor actually provides power information to the software. If you're writing software, you can actually go in and you can calculate the energy uh, that you're using at the socket level. Now, in addition to that, in your memory system, which is your second largest consumption, you can also get uh, power information for it in the server version. 
And we get that through the VR. So its accuracy is really dependent on uh, the VR's accuracy. Okay? Now that you have that, that you can read the power, what we can also do is we can start to control the power. And that becomes very important in your data centers. So what I'm showing you up above is this one is particularly controlling socket power. And what I'm showing you on the right is what typical systems today do. They'll go and monitor it. They'll adjust their frequencies for the cores. And they'll be able to control power. But the monitoring is done externally. Okay? And so its control is kind of um, isn't as accurate. On the left is the power control unit inside the die, which has a very shorter feedback loop. Not only that, uh, it's about 10x shorter. And it's monitoring everything that's going on the die from all of our sensors so that if an I.O. starts to go to sleep, that extra two watts, we can take that two watts and we can give it somewhere else. So it's monitoring all of that. And what that does with the shorter control loop is it gives you a more stable limiting power. Okay. Now, why do I care about that? I care about that because when I'm starting to load up my data center, um, this middle one is what I would do with the older solutions. I can get 12 servers per rack. In the third column, now with this more accurate power limiting capability, I can fit 14 in there. So I can get a higher performance per density in my data center on the racks. Okay? Not only that, uh, this RAPL running average power limiting can allow you to actually distribute power across your servers and your racks. And that combined with some of the feedback that we can give you through the power control unit on efficiency, performance per watt, you can actually use a budgeting algorithm and maximize your performance per watt at the rack level. Okay. Okay. I will show you this graph because my team is extremely proud of this. Uh, what this is, is this is the load line with various power caps. And the reason that uh, my team loves this so much is because this is showing turbo working, RAPL working, power meter working. Um, all of our core C states, our GVs, uh, Geyserville, voltage frequency scaling, all of those systems working together. Uh, this was a great day when we could see this uh, in the lab. Okay. And now I'd like to talk about uh, performance. So I'll hit only a few things on the performance. Jeff hit a lot about the core. Uh, one of the things that's really uh, phenomenal about this part is actually uh, the memory controller. And if you look at our memory bandwidth, uh, up above you'll see a graph. This is for reads. Okay? And this one is a two-socket system. And in this system, compared to our previous system, uh, we've added an additional channel on each socket. So that should have given us 33% improvement. Uh, we went from 1333 uh, to a 1600 speed for DDR3. And that should have given us a 20% improvement. But actually, what we get on the system is a 2x improvement. And that's really due to uh, a better, more efficient algorithm in the memory controller. So this memory controller gives us excellent performance, and it gives us very good power savings with the uh, multi-rank CKE. Uh, the other was the distributed L3, which I described earlier. Uh, this one is actually showing some figures, and this is assuming uh, turboing with less than eight cores. Uh, the other parts that really bring us performance are the dual load ports on the L1, and then also Sandy Bridge uh, Turbo 2.0. And you've probably heard this in almost all of our products we support this, but it's a, it allows us to burst. And what we're effectively doing is we're projecting the thermal capacity in the heat sink. So when you turbo, one of the first of the five different limits you'll hit before you, you need to stop turboing is usually thermal. And so by keeping track of how much thermal energy we're putting into the heat sink, uh, we can burst when we have credit. And then um, when we're going to sleep, we accumulate credits. And that helps us in, uh, in several benchmarks. Even in spec, uh, we see benefit. So I want to show you this graph. And this one we're very proud of, too. This is a core scalability. And what you're really looking at is in the first one is four cores. And then uh, what we do is we show the speed up going to eight cores. And the ideal system would have a 2x speed up. And 
with this part, we actually see uh, some benchmarks come very close to 2.0. Okay. Uh, the first one is spec int, um, spec int rate, and then the second one is spec FP rate. And the bars in red are apps that are so bandwidth uh, constrained uh, that adding the additional cores don't help. But for the ones that it, uh, aren't bandwidth constrained, we get good speed up. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close out. This is my final foil. Um, this one uh, comes from our competitive team, and what it does, it just gives you an idea of the performance uh, that you'll see compared to our previous Westmere part. And it starts out with our enterprise uh, applications, and then it goes up into technical computing. This is mainly HPC, and this is using the AVX 256-bit uh, vector operations. Uh, that's why you're seeing a greater than 2.0 um, execution. So in this part, uh, as Jeff said, we had widened the vector instructions to allow twice as much uh, computation. Um, so this time, I really want to, Jeff and I both want to thank uh, the Sandy Bridge team. Uh, it was actually six years to produce this part, and there were uh, a lot of challenges uh, that the design team and the architects had to go through uh, to get it here. All right, thanks, Jeff and Mark. Got a chance for a few questions. And here we go. And here's our first question. Good talk. So um, in, a, in a prior talk in the Medfield design, the uh, race to idle concept was, oh, I'm Sam Nassiger, MD, sorry. Uh, was uh, promoted as a way to improve energy efficiency. For your flat spec power load line, yeah. can you comment on whether you employ that technique or so, emphasize going to So more for servers, uh, race to halt doesn't uh, work for us. And, and the reason it doesn't is uh, think about it this way. Um, for us, for you to actually be power efficient, you need to be able to turn off almost all of the die. Okay, uh, in this part, uh, even though one core finishes a transaction, you just bought a transaction on eBay, you bought your, your new thing, that core can go to sleep. As long as there exists one more core up anywhere in the system, in any socket, we basically have to keep the rest of the uncore up. Uh, and because of that, uh, what we do is we more optimize um, for dynamic uh, operation. So, I, I think we're also, the latency to go from idle to non-idle is also critical. We have very... Yeah. So uh, the reason we have to do that is we have to give a guarantee to the operating system. Uh, if it needs memory on any one of those sockets from that core, we have to give it to it within a certain time. And uh, shutting things off, we can't turn up, uh, turn that on quick enough to, to meet that. Thanks. All right. Go ahead. Don Banks, Cisco. Um, on this architecture, is the cross-socket memory access still NUMA? And is there an additional cost to cross-socket uh, memory, cross memory access? Yeah. Or is it They're, uniform access? Um, we support both modes. Almost all of our customers and um, all the benchmarks are usually NUMA optimized. Okay, What's but the there cost? is an additional. Well, it, 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 is, it is one coherence domain, but and so there, there are some side effects to that, but I mean, NUMA makes a lot more sense if you can avoid the yeah. CPR. But there was significant cost in previous generations to a cross-socket memory access due to NUMA. And I'm wondering what the cost is as opposed to a local access in this implementation. I'm, I'm trying to, he, he's saying what's the difference between a remote access okay. and well, a local. Right, so, was, so I, I think, I think I, it's... I th uh, so we've, we've about tuned, I think the, the, this cross-snoop time, which you need to do, May need to do is about the same as the memory lookup time. We're pretty close there, aren't we? So, uh, I, I think it's about 30 nanoseconds. Yeah. That's something that I can go look up. Okay, thanks. Got another question standing by the mic or just standing? Looks like we're all set. All right, thanks, thank, you. thank you. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so as always, Intel innovates, and they innovated this time by having two speakers instead of, as everyone else did, one speaker. And as you can see, there's lots of companies around that are fast followers. It turns out our next presentation will have two speakers as well. So we're going to hear about the uh, X-Gene 64-bit ARM CPU uh, and SOC uh, from Applied Microcircuits. Uh, this will be presented by Paramesh Gopi, who is the president and CEO of Applied Microcircuits. Before Applied Micro, he had positions at Marvell, where he worked uh, on various aspects of the Sony PlayStation, the iPhone, and wireless ecosystems. Uh, and he has, holds multiple patents in wireless uh, networking and a doctorate in EE and computer engineering from UC Irvine. And Gaurav Singh, uh, who joined at Applied as Vice President of Engineering. Uh, he's responsible for ARM and PowerPC engineering, platform architecture and product development uh, for microprocessors and SOCs. Before that, he uh, was a director of RTL design at uh, RMI, uh, where he worked on the SL XLS and XLP processors. And before that, he worked uh, at, on the K6 and uh, Athlon and Opteron processors at AMD. Uh, Gaurav has a double E, uh, a graduate degree in double E from the University of Southern California. So please welcome them. <clears throat> Thanks, Fred, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I figured uh, I'd take a few minutes to uh, start this off because we want to uh, contextualize the impact of what we've done here over the last three years in terms of uh, really trying to change and create a new category of, of data center server. Um, you know, over the last three years, it's pretty undisputable that we've got the blurring of the social media consumer effect in terms of data experience, data access, uh, and, and the enterprise notion of how do you seek and access and, and deal with data. So we see those two worlds starting to merge. And that trend has led to the, uh, to the scaling out of large data centers where TCO, total cost of ownership, has become the actual key metric uh, in terms of the profitability and the sustainability of that large infrastructure. Um, one of the key parts of essentially looking at this, uh, at this new trend is to understand the implications of this trend to the actual new and emerging data center class. Uh, and I think that has been well documented by large, uh, very super scale internet service providers today, the likes of Google, Amazon, Facebook. But the, the real key here is the requirement and the need for a new category of purpose-built servers. And to just to contextualize a little more, the new cloud workloads require three things. Extremely nimble communications infrastructure combined with extremely performance-oriented CPU architectures and the ability to leverage a, a very, very open source software ecosystem. Um, all those three have come together. We are at the precipice of what I believe is going to be a very, very important segment that comes into play. And if I were to look at the centerpiece of this segment, it involves the ability, it involves the rethinking of a server grounds up for this particular category of cloud services. What do I mean by that? In this new world, latency, we're talking about Drupal latencies of between 50 and 20 milliseconds. We are talking about TCO, that is about 60 to 75% lower than existing architectures for specific big data workloads. And we're talking about the ability to scale out in terms of thousands of compute cores that are essentially out of order machines linked by large terabit fabrics. We have taken the first step in doing something unique, which is to take 10 gig PCIe Gen 3, 40 gigabytes of memory fabric, and basically a multi-terabit scale-out fabric and integrate them on one monolithic piece of silicon. 
This has never happened in the history of this particular industry. For once, we are not talking about CPUs. We are talking about a complete server on a chip platform. And that indeed is going to, in our minds, change the fundamental equation for TCO and change the very fundamentals of how the entire warehouse scale data center for cloud and enterprise will evolve. So having set context for you, let me turn the floor over to Gaurav to essentially uh, talk about this. But I thought I'd show you a piece of hardware before I get off stage here. This is real. Up to 256 gigabytes, I put it in my, in my passport pocket, 256 gigabytes of DDR, roughly 40 gigabytes per second of networking I.O., one device, integrated 10 gig, 17 lanes of PCI Gen 3, full mix signal, all on one die, eight cores and 16 cores, with a scale-out fabric interface that will allow us to scale up to 128, 256, and 512 cores in the very near future. So while we talk about PowerPoint in this industry, we're really looking forward to taking this segment and bringing reality to it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gaurav. Uh, can you guys hear me? OK. Well, thanks, Paramesh, for that introduction. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here in front of you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the details of, our, of the XGene platform architecture, including the uh, with special uh, insight into the CPU architecture. So as you know, we've designed our own CPU microarchitecture from ground up. I'll skip over the first slide, because Paramesh spoke about it. I'd like to just recap very quickly as to what the trends are in the cloud server platforms. So this is today. If you look at all the data centers today, they are 1U or 2U servers, each server being independent, independent in its chassis, in its I.O., cooling, storage, everything being common, uh, being, share, uh, being uh, unique for that node. And if you do the math, if you do the math on this and look at the components, you have the CPU, you have the chipset, you have an external NIC, there's memory, of course, you might even have an external HBA to connect to storage. There's lots and lots of components over here. So this is where I agree with Pat, with all due respect, because when you drive the power of the CPU down to zero, the math doesn't make sense in that platform architecture. But if you see where the industry is headed, it's headed towards where we have today, where the servers are now sharing the chassis, they share the cooling, they share the power supply, to where it's going next is where you don't, not only share the physics but you also share I.O. You share storage, you share the disk, you share an, an Ethernet port, you share PCIe ports. So in that new system environment, when you do the math, the math makes a lot more sense. It makes a lot more sense for an alternative, it makes a lot more sense for ARM. So what are the opportunities from hardware? Now the key is integration. Why have these multiple stages, why have a chipset when you can optimize all of that into a very tightly coupled, cost-effective, and power-efficient node. So the key thing is integration. You can integrate not only the CPU, but also the I.O., networking, and storage ports, all in one right-sized node. Then, and then you can replicate that node 100 and 1,000 times. Because one of the key things that's happening is in the data centers is the dramatic shift in the kind of workload that runs in the data center. Now it's about, as Pat mentioned, there's petabytes of unstructured data. And what's very important is that the petabytes of unstructured data needs to get access in a very short order. Latency is extremely, extremely important. So, it's lent the, so the, the, the workloads have scaled, the applications have scaled to be able to run on not just a few nodes, but on hundreds and thousands of nodes, especially for that reason. So the next frontier really is how do you design a system, how do you design a data center with the building blocks where each of these nodes, where you know that you're going to have hundreds and thousands of these nodes, but each node needs to be efficient. So it's about the integration, and then it's about the interconnect. It's about the fabric. The second is to break the trade-off between the classic Wimpy and Brawny cores. Uh, today you have a choice between higher and higher compute. You saw some of the previous slides where performance is just on, 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 on a tear, uh, and it's 
performance first and power is, is what you get. It's, it's, it's coming down, it's getting more efficient, but really it's, it's, it's performance first. On the other end of the spectrum, you have power, low power at any, any performance, right? But there's a big hole in the middle that really calls out for a high performance but power efficient node. And so that node has to be out of order. It has to, be, it has to have the integration. It has to have very tight latencies. Uh, so those are the opportunities from hardware that, that we at Applied Micro felt we needed to address. So when we started off looking at it about four years back, we very quickly realized that we wanted to have a very solid server class foundation. And the foundation had to be a world-class server class architecture. And so we chose the new 64-bit instruction set architecture from ARM. Uh, and if you look at the 64-bit instruction, the ARM v8, it's a very contemporaneous architecture. It compares with the best in the server space. Very high performance. It's got full CPU virtualization. And not just that, it also comprehends the I.O., uh, the interrupt timer virtualization. So it comprehends virtualization as a system. Enhanced SIMD, 120-bit SIMD unit. Very well-defined high-performance floating point unit. And the standard set of error handling, performance monitoring, instruction trace debug that you need. In addition, there's also crypto acceleration instructions. So ARM has done a very good job of really defining an architecture that allows companies like us to implement a very high-performance server class part. So what were the design goals that we gave to our CPU design team? As I mentioned, the first thing was high performance uh, at low power, and we wanted to hit the, strike the right balance between performance, power, and size. Uh, and we wanted to have extremely low, po low power microarchitecture. So we wanted to have the best of the breed, typical low power microarchitecture features. And they made all the way from the, picking the widgets that go into our pipeline, all the way from the predictors, uh, from the design of the caches, the, the renamers, very minimal set of instruction replay cases to all of the implementation-specific uh, low-power techniques. Next, we wanted to not just have a single CPU, single-threaded CPU, high performance, but we also wanted to have multi-core. We wanted to comprehend multi-core. So the CPU was designed from ground up to be a multi-core processor. And we can scale, as Parmesh mentioned, we can scale to many, many number of cores. And lastly, the challenge we gave to our design team was to design a high-performance core, but at the same time, make it portable. We wanted to be able to very quickly ride the technology wave to move from one process node to the other, one path to the other. So it's a fully synthesizable RTL. And our designers actually found a way to just use a very handful of custom macros. So there's, you know, I can count them in, 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 in one hand, very small set of custom macros, which we replicate. So next, we're going to look inside the building block, uh, what, we, what we call a processor module. So the processor module consists of two high-performance 64-bit CPUs, each with their own independent I and D cache. And the two CPUs share an L2 cache. We thought that this was the right building block. It gives us very high performance. And by keeping just two processors on an L2 cache, we get the sharing that you would expect. But at the same time, it makes the L2 very low latency and high throughput. Each of the cores is a quad issue, out of order, super scalar microarchitecture with a full slew of integer scalar and high-performance floating point instruction support. There's hardware virtualization built in natively, so we, it's a truly server-class virtualization support, uh, including nested page table walks, for instance. And then there's a, a full set of dynamic power management features. The cache hierarchy consists of a last-level cache, which is shared among the different uh, PMDs, so the processor modules, and I'll get to that in some of the later slides. Uh, and we built in server class RAS features. All of our structures are protected by parity or ECC, and we have end-to-end -end data poisoning and error isolation techniques. This is the first look inside of our 64-bit CPU. As you can see, it's a very high-performance uh, microarchitecture. Um, right up on the left top is the instruction fetch unit. I'll go into some more details in the, ne the next few slides. Uh, with the predictors the, the, and the instruction cache. Uh, the instruction uh, cache unit at the front end feeds into the grouping unit, where we group instructions into slots, send them down the pipe to the out-of-order execution units, each with the, their own schedulers. The global pipe control has all of the bookkeeping for, uh, for the reorder buffers and the branch checkpoint buffers that you would typically expect in a high-performance CPU design. The data cache unit on the upper right is, again, designed for high performance, but at the same time, low power. And then there's a floating point unit. The floating point unit is very tightly coupled to the CPU. It runs at full CPU frequency, and, it, and every CPU has its own floating point unit, so it's not shared. 
So if you look inside the instruction cache unit, uh, we can fetch multiple instructions per cycle. In fact, we can fetch up to 16 instructions in one cycle. We, can, we have pre-decode bits in the instruction cache, which is typically done to be able to find, uh, to pre-decode the instructions to allow a single cycle scan. So we can pick the first uh, predicted branch in a single cycle. There's a two-level branch predictor, the first level being the branch target buffer, which gives us very quick direction and the target address, and is backed up by large, sophisticated uh, predictors. Uh, and those predictors consist of the conditional call return branch predictor. And in addition, we also have a indirect history-based predictor, which is tuned for the sort of workloads that you find in the data centers. And as typically you find, we have a first level fully associative micro TLB. So next we look at the instruction decode and grouping. So we take the instructions, the ARM instructions from, from the, the iCache, and very early on in the pipe, we group them into quads. Uh, we also do on the fly, some of, some of the ARM instructions tend to be slightly more complex. We on the fly convert them into our own risk ops. Uh, from then on, the rest of the machine is a very high performance risk based machine. Uh, there's full renaming of registers, um, and then there's the dispatch into the execution schedulers, and there's no limitation on the grouping. For instance, we can have a branch in any slot. There's none of that. The instructions just flow through as quickly as possible into the execution units. So the pipeline control, as you typically expect, there's a branch checkpoint buffer, uh, which, which is fairly deep, which allows us to very quickly restore the state of the pipeline in case of a flush due to a branch mispredict. Uh, there's, there's a reorder buffer and a unified register file. The out input and output buffers are just for staging only. The instructions very quickly make their way into the schedulers. So now into the high performance out of order machine. Uh, we have a separate branch pipe, and the reason for that is because we want branches to resolve as quickly as possible, move right at the head of the queue, and get resolved as soon as possible. Then we have two integer pipes. There's a simple integer pipe, and there's a separate pipe that does both simple and complex instructions. There's a separate load pipe and a store pipe. And each of these pipelines has its own independent scheduler in front of it. And the reason, again, for that was that rather than having one big scheduler with lots and lots of ports, burning lots of power, each of these schedulers evaluates very quickly. You can do a single cycle schedule, uh, wake up and schedule in a single cycle. Uh, and they're also small. So for instance, if you have integer-centric uh, workloads, the rest of the pipes aren't burning that much power. We support memory dis disambiguation, so we allow loads to bypass loads, loads to bypass stores. Uh, it's typically you'd expect. Now the floating point unit. So the floating point unit, as I mentioned, runs at full frequency. Uh, actually, I should mention it's a floating point and a SIMD unit, uh, which has its own register renaming logic. Uh, it's completely out of order. Uh, we can do uh, full frequency scalar floating point, full frequency integer and floating point SIMD. Uh, and uh, thing to mention is that there is a separate load and store pipes within the floating point unit. Uh, so ARM defines lots of interesting instructions where uh, we can actually do a lot of scatter gather on the loads for floating point and SIMD on the fly. So the floating point unit, for instance, could be issuing a reg op at the same time doing a scatter gather for a load, scatter gather for a store, all, all in the same cycle. Next, the data cache unit. Um, again, uh, as a separate uh, fully associative TLB. Uh, the data cache unit is organized as a write-through, as a write-through to L2. Uh, and again, for typical reasons, it makes the data cache much simpler. And by making it simpler, it makes it very fast and also very low power. So it's highly banked to save power. Uh, so for instance, a word write only causes, causes a write into that small portion of the data cache. We don't have to light up. We don't have to do any complicated read modify writes. So again, uh, data cache very, uh, very, very fast. Uh, there's store data buffers, uh, where we store all of the speculative stores. Uh, the store data buffer also serves as a store forwarding buffer. That's, that's the SFB. And we allow loads to hit the stores and forward the data directly from the store data buffer without any hit to the load to use. There's a write combining queue on the way to the L2. So in case of streaming stores, we can, store, we, we can stream those stores into the write combining queue into a cache line and again, do a single cache line right into the L2. Again, that's very good for, for, for power and performance. And lastly, in the CPU, the MMU. Uh, the MMU is very sophisticated. Uh, in addition to having a very large set associative TLB, where we support all of the architecture page sizes, uh, it also has a set of page walkers and nested page walkers. 
So by the, with the nest, nested page walkers and hardware, we don't have to go to the hypervisor. If the guest OS misses, we can take care of the hardware. We don't have to invoke, invoke the hypervisor, again, for good performance. There's other goods features built in. We can cache some of the intermediate translations, so we don't have to go to uh, mem memory for those. So that's a very, there's a peek into our high performance out of order, uh, the world's first 64 bit processor. Uh, the next slide talks about the CPU and memory subsystem. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we wanted to focus also on not just a single core, but also on the multi core. So at the center of the CPU and memory subsystem is our coherent high performance core network. And the high performance core coherent network is, has a centralized Snoop controller. So requests from all of the agents go to the central Snoop controller. We launch the Snoops, get the, 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 the axe back, uh, and it's very high performance, so the data transfers starts happening in, in, in parallel to that, that protocol. Uh, so we have lots of bandwidth through this. So there's 200 gigabytes of bandwidth. This, I should mention, is actually sustainable bandwidth. Uh, there's no games over here in terms of bisectional, cross-section bandwidth. This is truly the bandwidth that you can achieve on a sustained basis through the fabric. Um, lots of instruction and flight, very low latency, um, and it's also decoupled. So each of the PMDs with processor modules can operate at their own, on their own voltage, and, and we can vary the frequency independently. The current uh, network also uh, consists of the TLB um, and global cache uh, operation support. So for instance, you can have a thread on one of the CPUs doing a TLB invalidate, of a, and that invalidate gets spread through the system, and we take care of that in hardware. The core network is tied to the bridges and the high performance bridges that fan out to multiple memory channels, so plenty of memory bandwidth, and uh, there's an I.O. bridge that, that fans out to our uh, I.O. subsystem. Unfortunately, there isn't enough time today to go over all of the goodies that we have on the SOC side, but we'll probably cover it in a, in, a, in a separate conversation. But I wanted to just give you a quick idea as to what we have on the SOC side. Uh, we have integrated, not only as, as Paramesh mentioned, we have integrated all of the peripherals that you would need in a server. So there's no reason to go to an external chip. We've integrated the multiple 10 gig IOs. We've integrated PCI Express. We've integrated, integrated storage. Uh, in addition, uh, this is where we bring some of our embedded legacy. I mean, Applied Micro has long history in network processors, so we do a lot of the embedded processing. We know how to do that. We've done that for, for many, many years. We bring all of that to bear here to be able to accelerate certain specific workload applications. So there's specific applications, so there's workload-specific accelerators that are built in that have a dramatic effect on not only the performance, but also on the power. So this is a quick introduction into XGene, which is the world's first 64-bit uh, ARM-based server on SOC, and now you can see why we say server on SOC, because we've really integrated all of the components you would need to make a very efficient single node that then you can replicate hundreds and thousands of times through a very efficient fabric. And this is available in the second half of this year. I just want to leave the last slide. This is more of a thought experiment as to what we would enable on the technologies that we're developing in Applied Micro. So it's not just about the compute, but it's all about also about how you, sharing I.O. in a dense system, as well as about uh, allowing interconnect of multiple of these nodes. So that was my last slide. All right, thank you. Let's uh, bring up the lights and see what questions. Uh, let's start over here. We got a lot of people over there. Uh, Satoshi Matsushita, NEC. I'd like to ask you the backward compatibility, the previous 32-bit uh, ARM um, instructions. And um, uh, what kind of technique do you apply for the, the backward compatibility? That is, uh, that, but what I, I'd like to ask you is, ARM uh, um, 32-bit instruction has a guard, in, guard, get, guarded instruction, like conditional, right. conditional execution, and the instruction right. with two destination registers, like uh, right. store incremental or something like that. So that is not uh, suitable for the ordinal right. out-of-order execution pipeline. So what, what is your technique? And sure. it, the, the second question is that how much performance is compromised? At, how, in, uh, how much com compromise did, did you add in terms of the power and performance for the, these uh, previous instructions? Sure, sure. That's a good question. So the, the question really is that, the, you know, if you look at the old 32-bit legacy ARM, which is, really has its roots in the embedded uh, space. There's lots of complex CISC-like instructions, a lot of predicated in instructions, I guess that's what you're referring to. How do we handle that, right? So one is that we're fully backward compatible, so you can take any of your existing 32-bit code, you can run it on our machine, and you get good performance, right? So the ans answer to that really is that on the 64-bit side, we have very high performance. However, 
on the 32-bit side, we've actually put in the hardware, and, and you'd be surprised. So the hardware really doesn't relate to power, it relates to complexity, right? So it's a slightly more complex pipe at the front end, right? Uh, but then when we break it down to the risk ops, the rest, rest of the machine is a simple risk, risk, risk machine. So to answer your question, yes, we support um, uh, both, uh, and we support them in a high-performance manner. It increases the complexity just slightly, but not, not the power. So, uh, do you have any specific technique to support such a, such a conditional execution or the yes. multiple, yeah. Yes, but I'm sorry, I can't get into okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, other side. Mark Augustin from Samsung. Um, you mentioned your integer side scheduler has a single cycle pick, and I was wondering if, if what you do, you're doing on the floating point side, if you also support a single cycle pick there. Yes, that's right. So yeah, so it's a, it's the scheduler on the floating point is, is just as high performance. Hi, uh, Shuja Jamil from Marvel. Um, nice to see a former Marvel guy. Um, yeah. So, uh, would you be willing to share any uh, uh, performance, power, or frequency data today? Right. Uh, the short answer is no. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and there's a good reason for it. Uh, I wanted to get into sort of the qualitative uh, you know, exposure into our microarchitecture. Okay. Uh, we will be coming out with product announcements, at which point we will be talking about frequency, performance, and so on. Okay. Uh, second question I had was on your uh, coherent interconnect. Uh, can you uh, get into at all uh, the topology of it? Like from Intel, we've heard the mm -hmm. ring topology. What kind, what kind of topology uh, is employed here? Sure, yeah, and I think if, if you look at it and you look at the, the bandwidth latency numbers, it's pretty clear. It, you know, it's, it's a switch. It's a switch. Okay. Um, and we've looked at, yeah, I and mean, there's pros and cons. And switch you know, as in full crossbar, mesh? What? Uh, one get into detail, it's a switch, it's not a ring. I can, I can tell you that much. Yeah, uh, we've, lo we've looked at all of them. I think what happens is that a ring is very easy for implementation, right? Uh, but as you scale, uh, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you really want that? Do you really want those additional hops, right? Do you want the additional complexity of a coherency protocol but that now needs to scan across where it's getting all the snoops, resolving them in one unit, sending them back? But there's also a routing cost, right? Yes, yes. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's basically complexity to uh, performance slash, you know, power trade-off, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, one, one final question. So uh, you, you mentioned that you have a unified register file, so I'm assuming... Uh, both uh, integer and the media registers are both uh, renamed. No, no, there's a separate register file on the integer side, separate on the floating. Okay, side. so yeah. what did you mean by unified register file? Uh, it's it's, it's an architecture from a microarchitecture point of view. It's a unified register file, so all integer results, for instance, feed into that single file. Uh, there are certainly other architectures where you can have distributed register files, or even on the integer side. That 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 that's. What oh, I are mean. you talking about a physical register file versus right. a ROB style? Okay. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you very much. All right, still on this side. Thank you for coming today. Uh, Todd Besnick, um, Omnifidus. Uh, you mentioned the complexity of the ISA. Um, can you give any reason other than kind of the obvious business reasons for not going with MIPS? Um, well, I, I, you know, I, as Fred mentioned, I've I spent many years at RMI designing MIPS processors. In fact, you know, designed the XL, XLP. Uh, so I do have soft, soft spot for MIPS. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into these sort of architecture details because that's a fairly well understood, uh, you know, thing at this point. Uh, I mean, I, I guess the reason why we picked, uh, I, I guess we were a PowerPC house but in, in the embedded, and we continue to be PowerPC in the, in the embedded. And why did we pick ARM for the server space? It's, it's about ecosystem. It's about having all of the features that you need in the server space, like virtualization, uh, not just on the CPU side, but throughout the system, all of the RAS features, all of the instructions that support in, ter in terms of SIMD. Um, you know, it's just all of that combined. I mean, the ARM, 64-bit ARM is truly a server class instruction set architecture. Roger Duran, Cal State East Bay. Um, I guess just to follow up on our keynote uh, address, uh, when are you going to add x86 interpreter to this? <laughs> so, well, we would do that if, if it made sense. But quite frankly, the x86 brings with it lots of legacy, right? There's lots of legacy. There's a lot of complexity associated with x86. And we, if we try to do x86, our performance per watt equation would be no better than Intel's, right? The reason that we can have an advantage in terms of cost and in terms of performance, in terms of power, is really the fact that we have a much, it's a, it's a much simpler ISA. Uh, but yes, I mean, it, it is an interesting proposition. I think a lot of people are trying to do that, uh, but uh, 
we, we believe that the ARM ecosystem has enough legs on its own to sustain itself in the, in the, in the server data center market. All right, well, we have a minute and a half, so just for fun, let's try a show of hands. How many people in, uh, in the next five years think uh, ARM will take 25% of the server market? It's quite a few, Fred. Wow, okay, 10%. One percent <laughs> and zero. See, Fred. Looks <laughs> looks promising. All right. Thank you, guys. Fred.